Okay, well, good evening, everyone. It's uh, wonderful to see you all. And it seems that uh, maybe we still have some that uh, didn't quite get the memo that we're switching to a new meeting ID, but uh, I'm sure they'll, they'll catch on soon. We wanna get started. We have a few topics that we wanna to look at today. And, uh, but before we get there, we want to certainly open up with a word of prayer. Brother Matthew Kervakel, can you hear me, brother? Can you hear me? Yes, there you go. There you go. Can you open up with a word of prayer for us? Sure. Jesus, Lord, and Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this evening that you granted to us for us to get here to study from the word. Father, we acknowledge that the word is given to us for our correction and to live righteously for your glory. We need the, the things that we learn as we, the pro, pro, prophecies and things uh, uh, things to come and we make us make us feel that uh, we need to be more active and uh, get busy you know, sharing the gospel whether we uh, commit our uh, teachers uh, dr alexander kurian and dr jordan matthew into your hands as they will be handling the subjects or give them the um the the fluency to to present and also the enlightenment whether we as for your guidance and everything that we do, we ask in the precious name of our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 And thank you, brother. Okay, so we have two topics that we want to get into this evening. And if you saw the flyer, then you know what those are. Uh, the first is going to be a new topic, and we are going to do, to discuss Melchizedek. And this is something that is of a great interest to many. And in fact, I was just telling Brother John Matthew, this is something that, that we were discussing together as a family uh, because we came across this portion in Hebrews in our reading. So uh, certainly something that is of great interest. And then we will be wrapping up the uh, parable of the soils uh, or, the so or the sower, depending on what you're looking at in your Bible. But uh, I believe our brother, Dr. Alexander, was mentioning that, uh, that he generally refers to this parable as the parable of the soils, and he gave his reasons for that. Uh, so we'll be looking at that again and uh, coming to a conclusion on that portion, on that parable. So we want to go ahead and move forward. That way we have plenty of time for questions and, and uh, instruction. So, Dr. John Matthew, I wanted to pose this, this first topic for you. Uh, so Melchizedek is quite controversial and many will say that melchizedek is uh, is christ a type of christ uh, is a theophany or just someone different altogether and there are many different understandings interpretations and if you look in commentaries every commentary will probably have a different interpretation so brother can you shed some light on this topic and can you give us a proper understanding both from uh, what we see in scripture and and also uh, what we understand maybe from prophecy and even just common sense as our dear brother Dr. Alexander made sure to remind us of uh, a few sessions ago that uh, when the common sense makes plain sense that it should be the only sense maybe I got that right I don't know brother it was a few sessions ago you can correct me on that uh, so Dr. John Matthew can you go ahead and, and discuss then Melchizedek for us uh, sure. Thank you. Good evening, brothers and sisters. I thank the Lord for this opportunity. And this subject is uh, very confusing. Just like you mentioned, people make it hard. People create problems. Just like Dr. Alexander stated before, if you apply common sense and plain reading, you can avoid a lot of confusion. Melchizedek is one of the intriguing characters in the Bible. He shoots across the horizon of Old Testament history like a flashing meteor and disappear. He is mentioned only in three books of the Bible. Some scholars teach that he was Michael the Archangel. Another group teach that Melchizedek was our Lord Jesus Christ. The Genesis account introduces him as a king of Salem. You know, Salem, you know, that um, at Jerusalem, uh, later became Jerusalem during the time of Abraham. 
first we read about him in genesis chapter 14 and later in psalms 110 in the new testament melchizedek is mentioned in hebrews chapters 5 6 and 7 and chapter 7 is completely devoted for him jewish scholars and many christian scholars teach that uh, melchizedek was shame son of noah only 450 years had passed between the flood and the overthrow of sodom and gomorrah shame was alive at the time of the destruction of sodom and gomorrah and shame lived 50 more years after the dis- destruction of sodom and gomorrah the destruction of sodom and gomorrah was only 100 years after noah's death so when they assume that um, shame was uh, melchizedek it kind of logical but doesn't make any sense at all when he says that melchizedek has no genealogy no father no uh, no record of his birth and death and everything so genealogy is the most confusing section created all these problems for the bible interpretation the description uh, provided in genesis is a paradox and unusual after the fall of adam every character has a genealogy if you read bible especially if you want to know the genealogy just go to chronicle first chronicle chapter 1 and the rest of the chronicle book you can see a lot of genealogy what is interesting about melchizedek is that there is no record of his birth or death it doesn't mean that he is eternal it simply means in the book of genesis which is a uh, genealogical book does not provide the record that is the simple meaning Ma- melek in hebrew means king sedek means righteousness so he was a king of righteousness furthermore uh, we need to look at his kingdom he is the ki- king of salem in hebrew the meaning is shalom or peace in english when we greet people we say good morning or good, ta- good afternoon or good, uh, good night and uh, in hebrew they say shalom in india uh, when we meet somebody uh, first we say namaste and arabic uh, muslims say salam alaikum so shalom means peace so his kingdom uh, is the kingdom of peace since melchizedek was a man he had both a father and mother so that's the truth don't misunderstand but unlike aaron's lineage nothing is recorded in scripture about his birth and death hebrews chapter 7 verse 3 create more confusion for many readers just like uh, when we mentioned if you apply common sense and uh, plain reading th- there should not be any confusion Melik- melchizedek was made like the son of god or resemble resembling the son of god so some say that this verse implies a theophany this means manifestation of jesus christ however the text uh, clearly states that he was made like the son of god all the theophanies were always temporary manifestations we know that there are hundreds of prophecies about the incarnation of jesus christ in bethlehem if melchizedek was jesus what about the prophecies all those prophecies if anyone believe that melchizedek was jesus we had to believe that the birth of jesus in bethlehem was his second birth on on the earth so i have heard in our chapel and many other places many uh, speakers speak that jesus christ uh, was um, melchizedek was jesus christ is a pre incarnate christ that doesn't actually make any sense we read about a pre incarnate christ appearing numerous times in old testament times as the angel of the lord all those appearances were for a special purpose and last only a few minutes in genesis 18 we read that jesus waited and labraham to prepare a food after killing a calf he waited until the food was ready melchizedek is a type of christ this is the most important thing melchizedek is a type of christ typology is a special kind of symbol symbolism a symbol is something that represents something else a type in scripture is a person or thing in the old testament that foreshadows a person or thing in the new testament for example the flood of noah's day is used as a type of baptism in first peter chapter 3 verse 20 and 
the bronze serpent typified Jesus Christ. The sacrificial lamb typifies Christ. So though Melchizedek is no way equal to Christ, his unique priesthood and even his name typified Jesus Christ and his work in a number of significant ways. In Genesis 14, we have a remarkable picture of what will happen at the end of this present age. Jesus Christ, king and priest in one person, will show himself from heaven with a blessing in his hands for Israel and earth. So we see that in Old Testament times, kings were separate, priests were separate, but Melchizedek was king as well as a priest also. Jesus Christ also will come as a king and a priest also. Raymond, would you be able to read for me Ephesians chapter verse, uh, chapter 1 verse 10? It's very important. Uh, uh, our blessed hope hinges on this verse and it's always I derive pleasure from uh, this verse. Give that to me, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 10. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 10. Mm -hmm. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. Uh, thank you for reading that. Uh, if you read commentaries, you can, we, we get a vague and ambiguous explanation about this. Many preachers also, they don't explain it properly. But this is the most important uh, blessed, uh, blessed uh, this is the most important verse that they give us a blessed hope in our day-to-day -day Christian life. The whole and complete fulfillment of the work of Christ is summed up in this verse. During the millennial reign of Christ, the believers of the church age will reign with Christ. That means we are going to reign with Christ, just like we have discussed it before. Our place will be in the New Jerusalem, and from there we shall exercise enormous power and authority over the earth. The Gentile world rule will end, and Jews will replace the Gentile in all the seats of power. The Lord Jesus will sit on the throne of David in Jerusalem. The 12 apostles will sit on 12 thrones and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. The Jews will govern the nations for God. Such will be the dispensation of the fullness of times, as Paul called it in Ephesians chapter uh, 1 verse 10. You just read it. All things will be summed up in Christ, and he will turn over the kingdom to Father. Jesus will subdue all enemies. You know that our last enemy is death. After that, Jesus will turn over the kingdom to the Father, and new earth also. Jesus will be our King of kings, and he will rule everything in heaven and earth, will reconcile. Everything will be unified in Jesus Christ. That's the blessed hope we have. So Melchizedek is a type of Jesus Christ. He was not Jesus Christ. He was not Michael, and it was not recorded uh, in the scripture. That's a type. So we make it can uh, make it more co uh, complicated when we interpret things. Just like I have mentioned before, we have a th more than 31,000 uh, verses in the Bible, but we have at present 35,000 denominations. So when we, when people read Bible, uh, the verses, uh, I don't know, uh, they purposely wanted to create something new and they make a wide interpretations. So if, if I need a brain surgery, I will never go to a, a, a doctor with a diploma with a two years uh, education. So I'm not uh, saying that uh, we should go to Bible school and uh, study and advanced study or anything like uh, Alexander, Dr. Alexander or anything like that. But uh, if you read scripture, if you submit uh, yourself to Holy Spirit and uh, read the verses at least 10 times and meditate, the Holy Spirit will reveal it to you. And uh, instead of reading one verse and uh, superfluously and uh, create a theology, just like here, when they say that Melchizedek was like the son of God, he's not son of God. So that's plain and simple. And I hope uh, I explained it properly. Uh, Raymond, back to you. And uh, question answer on Dr. Alexander for comment also. Yeah, thank you, brother. Thank you. Uh, I do want to go back to something perhaps in a little bit, but I want to go to Dr. Alexander first. So, brother, you've heard what uh, Dr. John Matthew has mentioned concerning um, Melchizedek and 
using these verses and, and some of it is confusing. So is there anything you would like to add to what he has already mentioned? Um, thank you. Um, I would uh, probably agree with uh, everything what uh, Dr. John Matthew presented because that is the most uh, uh, sensible interpretation with the hermeneutical integrity. So uh, if you stretch it in any other way, uh, we will not do justice to the hermeneutical principles. So the writer to the Hebrews, the reason the writer to the Hebrews takes this character Melchizedek because that fits his purpose very well. He is a king priest, number one. Number two, since he does not have his genealogy recorded, there is a kind of a perpetuity, a continuation of his priesthood. Uh, at least that imagery fits in very well. So uh, he wants to prove that the Lord Jesus Christ priesthood is not Aaronic priesthood. It is a different order of priesthood. And what is the different order? The different order is the order of Melchizedek. So Melchizedek as a type fits in very well with the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, it is for that purpose that the writer to the Hebrews brings him into the picture. Now, uh, another thing which I often have wondered about this uh, Genesis 14 record, he is the king priest of the most high god, El Elyon. So even during Abraham's time, like in the historical milieu of Genesis 14, I believe, even though we do not have the details of it, there might have been a group of people in Jerusalem who were faithful to the true and the living God, the creator God, and they lived in Jerusalem and served him under this king priest. So that is why he is presented as the uh, king of Salem, and he is a priest of God El Elyon, most high God. So there would have been a remnant of God who might have re received a supernatural revelation from God concerning this only true and the living God, and they assembled to worship and offer some kind of sacrifices to him maybe, and uh, under the leadership of this king priest. So that also is a very important truth revealed to us, even though we do not have all the historical information concerning uh, all the details of that. So that is how he's presented it in Genesis 14. So he is, you know, as we just now heard, uh, you know, he is a king priest and he fits in very well with the purpose of the writer to the Hebrews to compare him to the Lord Jesus Christ and to his uh, eternal perpetual priesthood as the uh, king priest. Uh, just... Uh, I always connect this with uh, the story of King Uzziah in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, Azariah or Uzziah, and also Isaiah chapter 6. The reason Uzziah died is that he wanted to be a priest also, and uh, he became a leper, God's judgment, instantaneous judgment came upon him. The reason is that particular office of king, priest, prophet in one person is reserved only for the Messiah. So Uzziah was trying to usurp the place, a unique place, which was not reserved for anyone else. It is only exclusively reserved for the Messiah. So I believe that is the reason that the terrible instant judgment of God came upon Uzziah. Uh, whether Uzziah was aware of it or not, I'm not sure, but, uh, you know, he was ordained as a priest, uh, sorry, king, and he also wanted to be a priest. What's the big deal? Yes, it's a big deal in God's prophetic program, because the only one 
anointed, ordained as a king, the three offices in one person. It is only reserved for the Lord Jesus Christ. And when somebody tries to knowingly or unknowingly usurp that place, he is playing with fire. And that is what we find in the history of Uzziah. I have always connected it that way. Thank you. Thank you, brother. So, you know, I think those are some wonderful thoughts there combined. Um, the important part that uh, I think both brothers mentioned that uh, Melchizedek is not um, a theophany, a theophany being um, Christ appearing on earth um, for a limited time prior to uh, his birth. And then to differentiate then a Christophany, his appearing after, after his death. Uh, the other thing was this uh, concept of Melchizedek giving us an example of um, some of the characteristics of Christ. So I think that's important that um, these characteristics are typified in Melchizedek. I'm always careful with typology. I won't uh, go into that at the moment. And I think we should be careful not to use the word type and just kind of throw it around. We need to be careful with that. But certainly the characteristics of Melchizedek and his king priest um, and then his genealogy being left out uh, certainly typifies our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So questions. There are many questions that uh, that are often had. So does anybody have a question concerning Melchizedek? Well, it looks like you must have explained it perfectly, brothers. Mm -hmm. I think you covered everything. I had a quick question. Okay, brother, go ahead. In Hebrews 7, 3, it says, talking about Melchizedek, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. So if he has no beginning of days nor end of life, does that mean he is eternal? I don't think he's eternal, you know, just uh, just like as a type, Holy Spirit purposely did not disclose his uh, beginning and the end, birth and death, you know. So to compare to Jesus Christ in the future as a type, purposely, mm -hmm. Holy Spirit did not want us to know. That's the only thing. But uh, Mekhesek was not eternal at all. He had a father and he had a mother, and uh, it was not disclosed and uh, for a special purpose. So many things are not explained in the Bible. There are things which are uh, hidden from us, and it's not fundamental. But we, we, it doesn't matter whether Mekhesedek uh, had a, a father or mother mentioned or not mentioned. You know, it's not coming with the fundamental. It's not affecting fundamental doctrines, anything like that. So there are many ambiguous and vague. Uh, scriptural portions in the Bible. So we had to be very careful in dealing with those kind of things. So I don't think he's eternal and he had a father and mother and he had a beginning and end. As a type, uh, the Holy Spirit wanted to keep it a secret. Mm -hmm. Yes, N no record of his genealogy about his parents or his family or anything. None of those things are available to us. Uh, the Holy Spirit probably purposely have hidden it so that the writer to the Hebrews could make this uh, unique and wonderful comparison uh, in his uh, typology uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ. So, you know, uh, the scriptures contain no record of uh, his parentage or his genealogy so that he might be more perfectly likened uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ in his uh, eternal, uh, in, in a new order of eternal priesthood. Okay, so do we have any other questions? Okay, wonderful. Well, uh, Dr. John Matthew, Dr. Alexander, and I guess um, you've answered all the questions there are concerning Melchizedek.
uh, everybody can throw away all the him the uh, commentaries in on that portion. I just refer back to the YouTube video, I guess. Okay, I'm sure other questions will come up, and that's okay. We will have time for that uh, in other sessions. So if you have a question and it comes up to you in the middle of the night, don't worry. Just uh, just write it down so you don't forget, and then we can get back to that. So we want to go ahead and move forward then uh, to the second topic, and this is a continuation. Uh, concerning uh, the parables, this is understanding and applying the parables, and specifically the parable of the sower, as you will probably see in, in your Bibles, or as has been mentioned, the parable of the soils. And uh, so, Dr. Alexander, can you go ahead and, and take us through the concluding portion of the parable of the soils? Yes, um, the reason we wanted to look at this parable is because of its uh, relevance and its, uh, you know, uh, deep application to all of us because all of us are involved uh, in God's kingdom agenda. And the parable was stated in relation to the mystery form of the kingdom. So this parable tells us how people would react uh, even during our lifetime, you know, when the king is away in this uh, interadvent time between the first coming and the second coming during this church age, how people will react to God's kingdom agenda to the king and to his message. So, uh, you know, as I repeatedly reminded last week, this is the only parable mentioned by Matthew, Mark and Luke. The only parable mentioned by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Number one. Number two, when the Lord started his parabolic teaching in Matthew 13, this is the first parable he said. This is number one. So that all shows its importance. Three times repeated, first one for the Lord to teach. Then another unique feature of this parable, the Lord took the time to give us a detailed interpretation of this parable so that we don't have to do any guesswork on it, that we don't have to just go with the, what the commentaries are saying, because the, the, the Lord wanted to make sure that we should not make any mistake in the interpretation of this parable. Even though he did not give the meaning of many other parables, the Lord made sure that we get this right. So, I just wanted to, the parable is very familiar, so I just wanted to highlight the applications I have learned, and that may be very edifying to us. So, when the sower sows the seed, it does not produce uniform result, and that is what uh, I was sharing uh, with you last week. So, we should not expect a uniform result. The success syndrome, which is very popular in missions today, in evangelism today, you know, about statistics and about all the success related to our evangelistic efforts. This parable does not support that kind of ideology. You know, this parable has no sympathy to the success syndrome in missions and evangelism. And it is a great encouragement for me personally to know that. So, and uh, this parable reminds that only statistically or mathematically only one out of four. You know, I'm not hyping on that calculation or that mathematical statistics. What we want to learn from here is that majority of the people who listen to the message of the gospel would probably reject it. So the Lord also made it clear that uh, narrow is the gate and difficult is the way. So the way I understand it, the entrance, narrow is the gate through which we enter. Difficult is the way, is the way of discipleship. That is how I, I interpret it, you know. So that is not only the entrance into the kingdom is a very important decisive choice, the life after that also is can be difficult. So narrow is the gate and difficult is the way. So people have different interpretations about it, but I believe the Lord was once we enter through the narrow gate, the Lord wants us to follow him 
in the path of discipleship. So, uh, the another important truth uh, in this parable is, like in even in Matthew 13, uh, in verse uh, 18 onwards, the Lord explained the parable. You know, see, the Lord made it very clear if you compare Matthew, Mark, and Luke, several details emerge, you know. So, the, uh, the seed is the word of God. I think, uh, you know, in Luke 8, 11, it is directly stated. In Matthew uh, 13, 19, when anyone hears the word, so the sower sows the word, you know. So the seed is the word. So that tells us what shall we preach, what shall we share uh, with uh, people in our gospel message, in our gospel presentation. We may use different methods, but the message should always be the clear presentation of the word, the gospel. The Lord said, the seed is the word. So our presentation of the message of the gospel should be word-oriented. Now we may use uh, apologetics, we may use you know, skit or people may use music, various means to present it. But when we present the gospel, it should be the word of God as revealed in the Holy Scriptures about the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ and about the need for faith and repentance and about the fall of man's sin. You know, the basic truths of the gospel. Some people use the four laws, you know, by Campus Crusade, uh, some people use the Roman road. May I ask you a question? You know, all these are good. There is nothing wrong in any of these things. But always remember that even if you do not know any of these methodology, remember this, that the seed is the word. The sower goes to sow the seed of the word, nothing else. So we cannot be supportive of any ministry, mission, or evangelistic efforts where the God of word of God is not preached. You know, we cannot be supportive of that because the seed is always uh, the word uh, of God. So that's a very important uh, truth uh, in this uh, parable. Then the Lord also reminded that you know, it, it falls on four types of different soils, four types of different uh, response. Uh, the first one, it falls on the wayside footpath. Uh, it uh, falls on the footpath or the wayside. And uh, we read in Matthew 19, uh, verse 20, Uh, verse 19, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. So he heard the word, but it is like uh, the footpath soil. What happens is, see, Satan comes and snatches it away. The word for snatch is the word for the rapture, the the strong Greek verb harpazo, snatch away, take by force. So when, when people hear the word, Satan does not want them to understand it. And suddenly, you know, the media propaganda against Christians, evangelicals, all the pastors are crooks, theory of evolution. Look at all these Christians, they are all hypocrites, they are all racists. You know, you know what is happening even today. So, Satan blocks the minds and hearts of people from really evaluating the gospel. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand, you know, they don't understand it. And the wicked one, Satan, comes and snatches away, takes it away by force, the seed. And some seed, uh, you know, fell on the rocky, stony place. 
uh, that produce some shallow results, superficial acceptance of the word, outwardly some excitement and joy, some kind of emotional conversions, but the roots could not push down to the soil to draw nourishment. No root and beliefs for a time. Verse 20, but he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulations or persecution arises, then the next part is very important. Because of the word, immediately he stumbles. See, there can be persecutions, there can be questions, there can be mocking, ridicule, offense, because of the word. The Greek preposition is dia, or through the word. You know, it is not the persecutions or the problems which we generate. It is because when we are committed to the gospel, when we are committed to follow the Lord, there will definitely be ridicule, mockery, persecution from family and the friends. Uh, Mark put it uh, this way, for the word's sake, you know. So the word creates problem. When we accept the word, when people turn to the gospel, we know about, I don't want to take the time to give examples or illustrations. We know about what is happening even in our country and in many, many different parts of the world. Then the third response is on thorny soil. That means it begins with well, interest and growth. But finally, the cares of the world uh, and all the cares and worries of this world uh, choke out uh, the word that is sown. So in verse 22, now he who received seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. You know, deceitfulness of riches, the Lord specified it, the mad rush to be wealthy. So, you know, they, 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 uh, the, these cares and worries and these temptation and trials, all these things chalk the word. In all three gospels, that word is used. It is chalking the gospel, chalk the word. So, uh, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you know, different kinds of weeds are mentioned, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust for other things, and the pleasures of this life, you know, they all choke the word. So, finally, it does not last. That is another kind of response. By the way, when the Lord said, Satan comes and takes the word, we should know that, our ministry of the gospel, ministry of the word, is a spiritual warfare because Satan accompanies each one of us when we go to sow the word. So if I go and if I go to preach the gospel here or in Africa or India, this parable taught me that Satan accompanies my trip. He comes with me. That's what the Lord said, because it is a spiritual warfare. He wants to take away the word which we planned, which we saw. So, brothers and sisters, we must be aware of that evangelism is a spiritual warfare. Four different responses to the soil. But the good news is, verse 23, but he who received seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. The, the result, the production of fruit may vary, but there will be some fruit. 
you know, in contemporary theology, there is a lot of discussion about uh, the experience of salvation, but all people who have been born again, will they produce fruit or will it be visible and questions like that. The book of James answers that uh, very clearly. This parable also tells us that there will be some fruit. You know, it may be 30, it may be 60, or it may be 100 fold. There will be some fruit. No fruit kind of salvation, I don't think that that matches with the Lord's teaching about this parable, teaching on evangelism, or that, that does not match with New Testament theology. So even in the controversy between the free grace and the Lordship salvation, you know, between MacArthur and others, this has been a constant debate that how can we always say that there will be some fruits in some people's life? There won't be any fruit. Uh, I think this parable clearly teaches us that there will be some fruit. The extent of the fruit, the depth of the fruit, the productivity, the quantity of the fruit may vary, you know, because the maturing process may take time in some people. Uh, but there will be some fruit uh, in the uh, life of people who have genuinely received the Lord and turned to him in repentance and faith. So uh, these uh, wonderful truths uh, about evangelism, our efforts in the gospel, in proclaiming the word of the kingdom, you know, this is, uh, these are very, very uh, important truths that should encourage us and that should give us great enlightenment as we uh, continue to serve the law. Uh, one more thing, the sower should not be selective in finding out the good soil. That some people have that temptation, you know. Uh, I think, you know, I also have been tempted at times that where there are looking for the productive soil and just go there and do the work. No, the Lord wants us to throw the seed, sow the seed in all sorts of soil. We don't have to be selective about that. You know, the, the sower went to sow the seed and some will naturally fall on the footpath, on the wayside, some among thorns, some uh, among stony ground, and some on, on the good ground. So we cannot pick and choose. Wherever the Lord sends us, we have to go. Wherever we have the opportunity, you know, uh, we have to go and uh, sow the seed. In Mark's vers version, the wicked one comes and snatches away. That is Matthew's version. In Mark's version, Satan comes immediately and takes away. It is Mark's favorite word, immediately. So Mark uses the word, you know, how, how true that is even today, you know. Look at uh, all the gospel efforts and people's response to that and all the objections to the word of God. So Mark records it 415, Satan comes immediately and takes away. Lift it away. He uses the word Iro, lift it away. Matthew uses the word snatches away. You know, uh, Luke also uses the word he, the devil comes and lifts, steals, takes away the word. Um, the, the wicked one comes or, you know, the present times is coming and snatches away the word. It is taking the word by for Satan is very, very active uh, wherever we sow the seed. So we have to faithfully press on, leaving the results to God, and God will definitely prepare some good soil for us. And some people will definitely respond positively to the gospel message. So those are some of the very, I did not get into all the details, but I thought that we may be more interested in the practical, applicational nature of this parable, because 
this parable itself is very, very uh, familiar to us. So, Pason, the Lord has promised uh, uh, definitely some results for the source, uh, for the seeds uh, which we sow in his name. Thank you, brother. You know, some wonderful points brought out, um, some that we've probably heard before, and that is that uh, fruit will be present. And of course, you mentioned James, and, and that's obvious that the fruit will be there. And it may look a little different. It may be a little more obvious, um, maybe more abundant in others. But uh, fruit will be present either way. And then, brother, I appreciate what, uh, what you brought out that uh, isn't uh, expressly stated in the text, but certainly implied that we cannot be selective. Uh, mm -hmm. So often we're tempted uh, what seems to be uh, our own way and our own plan, not the Lord's plan or the Lord's thought, but we think that we should go uh, to places where the response to the gospel is great, and we think that's where we need to be. And uh, thank you, brother, for that reminder that uh, it is not our responsibility to choose, but instead to sow, and the response will, will come either way. Now, I want to go ahead and turn to Dr. John Matthew uh, just in case he has any remarks uh, concerning this. I don't, I don't think you've responded to uh, these portions at all. We still have some time, brother. No, uh, thank you, Dr. Alexander. Uh, this parable is uh, very important. I wish, I have been thinking, pondering a while, Dr. Alexander uh, has been explaining this. If a charismatic and Pentecostal studied this parable, they could avoid uh, that uh, erroneous teaching that salvation can be lost. So that means, you know, when the seed is the sowing, you know, so some fell on the rocky grounds and uh, thorny grounds and all the seeds, you know, that uh, grow together, but only the seed uh, fell on the good, good ground, bore fruit. So when they see that, oh, so-and-so did this mistake and his salvation is lost, uh, you know, because they don't understand this parable. So everybody is coming to the chapel, you know, or, you know, the big church and then the, like a, a big rap music and the gospel rock music and everything and the hallelujah and jumping upside down and the praise the Lord, hallelujah. They may not be saved at all. So if I wish they study this parable can avoid that mistake. So they are prophecies. They are not true believers. Only seed fell on the good ground bore fruit. So in connection with that, uh, if you don't mind, Dr. Alexander uh, stated, I want to continue the last two sentences, you know, Matthew chapter 13, verse 24 to 30. Do you think you can read that, uh, uh, Raymond? Uh, so what Satan, what Satan is doing. Matthew 14. Uh, 13, yep. 24 to 30. Mm -hmm. So 13. Uh, Dr. Alexander was uh, mentioning the first parable from 13 also. Mm-hmm. So you want to read the parable of the wheat and tares? Yes. Yeah, 13, 24 to 30. Yeah. Okay. Another parable he put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servant of the owner came and said to him, sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, do you want us to go and gather them up? But he said, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at that time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Uh, thank, thank you, Bob Raymond. You know, so I think that Satan has been uh, from the beginning of time doing this. And still, number of days increased the activities. That's the the last sentence as a few Dr. Alexander mentioned. So I think the parable of the weed in the, the here allude the contamination of the seed of man. This I have been uh, I talked about the fallen angels a few weeks ago about the contamination. Coming back to you know Genesis chapter six verse five, you know point out the extreme wickedness of man at that time. God decided to wipe away all the humanity, almost the same, same thing is happening today. 
the people of our age are being subjected to constant conditioning process from news media, fake news media to become desensitized to all forms of evil. So I have a quote from my book, you know, Marriage and uh, Morality, page 29, you know, uh, late eight, eight, 80s, I wrote it. Uh, what is happening in America, the society, the culture, norm, the drug dealer is lionized. The man who mops the floor is scorned. The schoolgirl who get pregnant is envied. The schoolgirl who studies is taunted. At present in America, there are two heroes, George Floyd and uh, Jacob Blake. They were lifelong criminals. So NFL nowadays, uh, helmets, they are introducing helmets with their names. Although the police in both cases showed extreme and uh, unnecessary brutality, these two people are not role models. So, you know, present uh, candidates, you know, Biden and Camila went uh, to Jacob Blake's, uh, 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 went and visited hospital and condolences. But he did not visit the victim, uh, uh, the rape victim, and uh, did not do anything. So this is a age we are idolizing, making heroes, criminals, mm -hmm. making heroes. So Satan has been doing it from the beginning in contamination. The same thing is the, the gospel is preached, Satan is coming and uh, he is... Uh, destroying everything that is happening in the society. Just wa I wanted to add uh, my comment uh, with that. And uh, this parable, first parable, is very important. If they study that, we can avoid a lot of erroneous uh, doctrines. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you, brother. OK, so a lot has been said, much has been said concerning uh, the parable of the soils, but then also this, this follow up parable uh, just now. So are there any questions? We do have a little bit of time. Now we probably have time for one question before we close with prayer. Uh, does anybody have a question concerning this parable, uh, the discussions that uh, have been had concerning this parable, or maybe something about Melchizedek that you, you thought of after we moved on? Any questions? I have a question about uh, Melchizedek. And um... When we see in uh, Genesis 14 that um, Abraham went and, uh, you know, um, went, the, went the war for the kings and then he win the war and rescue his brother, I mean, Lot and his property and coming, coming back. And uh, king of uh, Sodom want to come and uh, welcome him. But all of a sudden the Melchizedek came with bread and wine and uh, celebrate the victory celebration and bless him and also bless the <laughs> father who, I mean, the God who delivered your enemies into your hand. This is a victory celebration he bring with the bread and wine. Not At that time, we look the different part. <laughs> Usually they bring the meat and bread. They kill the calves, they kill the, you know, uh, the, and uh, prepare the meal. But here, the Melchizedek is bringing the bread and wine and then celebrating the victory celebration and then acknowledging that the victory over the enemy is the work of the Most High, the, 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 the 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 Lord of the Creator of all. So is anything important for that, or it is just happened? I believe you know since uh, Melchizedek, you know many things are not written there. He was a spiritual you know tower, and uh, he that's why Abraham recognized him. He did not um, accept any honor from the king of Sodom, but uh, he went and uh, even gave tithe. To Melchizedek, so he was a towering, uh, acceptable figure there. And uh, since uh, Melchizedek is typifying Jesus Christ, he was bringing wine, bread and wine, indicating the uh, the body and the blood of Christ. Also, before that, that's why I believe that uh, that's why indicates that uh, that's why he represents Jesus Christ. Uh, now we look back to before uh, time frame, you know, 
4,000 years back, we know that uh, that syndicates that one. At that time, they did not know. Now we know that that indicate the uh, the but the body and the blood of Jesus Christ indicating Melchizedek was uh, bringing that. That's my personal opinion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And quick question, brother. Were you asking that in connection with Melchizedek being Christ or simply what was the significance of the bread and wine with the victory? I was the, asking for the significance of the bread and wine and also the celebration of the victory. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, I don't go to say that Melchizedek is a, is a uh, um, angel or, or uh, Jesus. Jesus or anything, you know, because that is not revealed in the Bible. So I just leave it like that. But, the, you know, what I am trying to learn that is there any significance of this bread and wine? Because at that time, usually... They, they, you know, they bring the, you know, meat and, uh, you know, bread. Hmm. Yes, well, I think, uh, you know, what Dr. John Matthew was saying, both in his response to your specific question, but also concerning uh, the passage in Hebrews, I think it's important that we understand that uh, Melchizedek and the characteristics of both his king priesthood, uh, along with this, what you're bringing up, the bread and wine, uh, the symbolism that he does not have beginning or end, his genealogy. Uh, all of these things are, are giving us an example, um, as Brother uh, Dr. John Matthew just mentioned, these typify characteristics of our Lord. And I think mm -hmm. that uh, the significance there, that all of these are, are giving us the same sort of symbolism. If that bread and wine represent that the Jesus body and bread, then that is... That is uh, uh, showing us he is a prophet too, is it? Well, it's possible. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good question. Say no. <laughs> King and priest, you know, some prophet also possible. Yeah. <laughs> so, Dr. Alexander, you want to take a crack at that one? Yeah, you know, that maybe we cannot read too much. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? that's true. yeah, but um, you know, uh, uh, I think uh, I will restrict uh, my view to what Dr. John Matthew generally said, all these things put together, when we look back, you know, it matches very well with the typology and uh, the relationship between Jesus Christ and Melchizedek. How individually, like, um, you know, meat and wine or everything, how we can exactly interpret it may be difficult, but generally speaking, it ties in very well with the typology, uh, which the writer to the Hebrews is trying to uh, uh, highlight in the uh, epistle. And the yeah. prophet imagery, you know, uh, has already been established uh, in the beginning of the epistle, like in uh, Hebrews chapter 1, you know, God has spoken in these last days to us in his son. So the superior final uh, decisive revelation, the revelation par excellence has already been given uh, through his son. Uh, so uh, not through the earlier prophets, but through the son, the finality of the revelation. So even from chapter one, the Lord Jesus Christ, Hebrews one, the Lord Jesus Christ is presented as a superior prophet or superior to all other prophets. Yes, that's, and that's an important aspect there as well. The superiority of Christ, as mentioned then to all of the examples in the first several chapters of Hebrews. Um, so appreciate that uh, final thought there, brother. Um, I know that, um, you know, we've had time for, for lots of discussion. We will have more time. Uh, time is, is not our friend. It is 8 o'clock already, and uh, I mentioned that we had time for one last question. Can so, I ask a question, Matthew? Uh, brother, we only had time for one question. Uh, sorry, that's what I mentioned right before Brother Sam asked. Um, but we will have more time next week, so please uh, write the question down or, or send it in so that we can, uh, we can remember it and then we can ask that question, discuss that topic next session. 
Ask the question but, in two seconds. What is the significance of paying tithe, giving tithe? Abraham gave yeah, tithe to like you said it. That's it. Brother, the, the question is short, but the answer may not. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, so we'll I don't hold, need the answer we'll today. Okay, told, very good. We give the answer next week. Okay. Wonderful. The significance of, of paying a tithe, and that's important. <laughs> I yeah. thought Sam was going to bring that up, and, and he didn't actually bring that up specifically. So, uh, Dr. John Matthew, the significance of, of paying yes. a tithe. So, sure. we'll definitely need to look into that. Mm -hmm. yes. So, Good. we'll go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Um, Brother Paul, would you mind closing us with a word of prayer? Okay. Dear Father, we just uh, thank you for this time to study your word. We just thank you that... Uh, you have revealed to us your wisdom. You have revealed to us the end of the world. And Lord, we just uh, pray that you'd be with us as we uh, evangelize, as we give out the gospel, knowing that uh, not everyone will respond. But Lord, we just pray for those that mm -hmm. will respond and are in the good soil. Lord, we just thank you that each one of us can believe in you as our Savior and that we will be with you forever. And Lord, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is the king, the prophet, the priest, that he is superior to all, and that uh, we will be with you and with him one day. We thank you for this time tonight and pray that you would bless Alexander Curian and John Matthew as they continue to study. We pray this in the Lord Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 Amen.